morning, Australia. Good evening, Paraguay and Chile. And welcome everyone who is joining from other countries. Today is the last session of the third edition of our conference series, Paraguay Speaks Australia. I am Mercedes Huidobro, the president of the Paraguayan Student Association at the University of Melbourne. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands from where we are all gather today and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Please note that this conference is being recorded so you can later revisit through our YouTube channel. We invite everyone to join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag PYSpeaks2021. We look forward to hearing what our diverse audience has to say. I would like to remind that this webinar will consist of a presentation given by the speaker, followed by some time for ask questions or comments. You can also leave your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Today's host is Adrian Hearn, Professor of Latin American Studies at the University of Melbourne. Professor Adrian has published six books on Latin America and China and an interactive 360 degrees film on indigenous ecological knowledge titled Who is Nature? In his career, he explores the cultural challenges and opportunities arising from international relations with questions such as what can Chinese, Latin American and Australian cities teach each other about sustainable food production and consumption? How are growing Chinese migrant communities contributing to Latin American economic development and globalization? He holds a doctorate of anthropology from La Trobe University and he holds a bachelor's of arts in anthropology from the University of Wisconsin. Professor Adrian has previously participated in our Paraguay Speaks event in 2019 and 2020. On behalf of the Paraguayan Student Association, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude for his continued support throughout these years. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mercedes, and welcome everybody to Australia, where we are uh based at the moment running this uh this webinar i'm conscious that there are people from paraguay from the uk and and elsewhere with us today uh, and of course from australia as well and um well for us at the university of melbourne this is i guess and for you probably too a new way of working where in a way this difficulty of covid and lockdowns enables us at least to connect more broadly than we might have otherwise and run events like this online. So it is uh, great to welcome you here. And particularly, I want to welcome Francisco Urdines, who uh, is our speaker for today, who will speak with us about the case of Paraguay and Taiwan. Uh, I thought just before I introduce Francisco, I would just mention uh, a small piece of context that might kind of help put some of this in perspective. Um, I just thought it would be useful to say uh, that this situation in Paraguay and uh, its recognition of Taiwan rather than uh, Beijing, rather than China as a diplomatic partner, um, you know, is a, a kind of part of a longer history. And uh, I just thought it would be useful to mention, right, that the, uh, the Kuomintang, which is the, the political party in Taiwan, um, also is known as the Chinese Nationalist Party. And uh, it was exiled to Taiwan in 1949 when the Chinese Communist Party took power in China. So a sort of competition between the Chinese Communist Party and the Kuomintang um, provoked this, in a way, an exile to Taiwan of the, uh, of the Kuomintang, which since then has kind of experienced this complicated and difficult relationship with China, with Beijing. And as you know, the, you'll have heard of the One China policy, uh, which is the policy from China, which uh, asserts that Taiwan is part of China and has no right to have its own government 
and to have diplomatic relationships around the world. So Paraguay is uh, part of this complex web of alliances and allegiances, but it's not the only one. There are a total of 16 countries in the world that recognize Taiwan instead of China. Uh, and nine of those countries are in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, in South America, Paraguay stands alone in that status. And I, I think what we'll learn today is a little bit about why Paraguay has chosen that path and what are some of the pressures which um, Paraguayan leaders are currently grappling with in their decisions you know, to, to maintain relations with Taiwan rather than to revert um, or to, to switch their allegiance to China. So this is quite a diplomatically heated conversation and I'm glad I'm not the one trying to present on it. This is why we have uh, Francisco to help navigate through this. Uh, Francisco, I, we, we met in uh, 2019 in Santiago de Chile for the first time. Um, and I learned then that although you, Francisco is based in um, Chile, he's actually from Argentina and um, focuses his work on the Southern Cone, particularly, um, particularly Brazil and Brazil's relations with China. But Paraguay, of course, has a lot in common with Brazil uh, in terms of agricultural production, for example, and the growing impact of the soybean industry um, in, uh, in, in Paraguay and across the Southern Cone. So I'll just introduce briefly uh, Francisco um, as our speaker today, as an associate professor of the, Internet, of the Institute of Political Science. Um, and he's also an affiliated professor at the Center of International Studies um, at the uh, Pontifica, Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. That's the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. And Francisco researches the international political economy of the region with a focus on emerging powers. And particularly, as I mentioned, looking at those relations between Brazil and China. He's published very widely and you can find his work. You might want to do that after this uh, webinar today, if you'd like more detail and look into uh, some of Francisco's work, you could find it in the Journal of Peace Research, uh, in the Chinese Journal of International Politics, in Foreign Policy Analysis, and several other journals. You just have to Google him and a whole bunch of stuff will come up. And I'd encourage you to do that. The other thing I'd encourage you to do um, is as Francisco is speaking, just kind of make some notes either on your computer or on paper or mentally so that it might provoke some questions. You know, there's always questions that arise from these complex topics. And the best way to, you know, explore those questions is to ask them and for us to discuss them. So after Francisco speaks, we'll have a chance to discuss any questions that you may have. So do feel free to, you know, um, make a note if issues come up that you'd like to follow up with Francisco um, after the, the kind of official presentation. Well, that's probably enough from me. So at this point, I'll hand over to Francisco. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you very much, Adrian. And thank you everyone for being here and uh, the Paraguay Speaks event for the kind invitation. Um, I'm glad to, to have the chance to, to share with you a bit of this experience, uh, this research experience. Uh, as Adrian said, this is um, a very heated topic. So for the record, I just want to say uh, the research was not funded by either Taiwanese nor Chinese institutions. And uh, actually I don't have a, a a position in this regard. It's a very sensitive topic that I wanted to understand. The reason why I became very interested in why Paraguay uh, recognizes Taiwan uh, started when I was a student, an undergrad student in Argentina, but especially I, I got very curious when I went to, to Paraguay in 2017. And I found out speaking to people that this was a very sensitive issue also within Paraguay. 
um, and people would be very, I mean, people were, were not very willing to speak about it. What's pretty much a taboo topic. Uh, so what I want to share with you is the research that I have carried out uh, for more than two years with a colleague, Tom Long, that eventually got published in Foreign Policy Analysis and explains, uh, at least we give an answer uh, to why Paraguay recognizes uh, Taiwan. Let me share the screen with you. Second. Do you see my slides or no? Now, there we are. So uh, thank you very much. And again, what I will try to give you is some insight on why Paraguay recognizes Taiwan. And as Adrian said, shuns China as a consequence of the one China policy. Um, so basically, um, this project addresses a broader question, which is why do some states choose to recognize the fact of states, uh, even when this involves potential costs? And more specifically, uh, bringing that, that question to the Paraguayan case, uh, given that under pressure from the one China policy, uh, Taiwan's remaining allies forego substantial Chinese investments, loans, and credits, why is it that Paraguay uh, recognizes uh, Taiwan? As Adrian said, uh, and we will go through that in a, in a moment, part of the answer has to do with non-material benefits. The role of the historical relationship between Taiwan and Paraguay, um, bonds between the foreign affairs minister, ministries, ideological connections as well, um, and uh, it's, it's really intriguing because it, it shows that material benefits um, are important, but there is a certain limit to that in international relations. And uh, Taiwan certainly has faced increasing diplomatic pressure uh, in the last um, only 15 countries, including the Vatican, uh, remain allies with Taiwan nowadays. And if you look at the figure in the right, you can see that several Latin American countries have changed relations uh, from recognizing Taiwan to recognizing China instead. Um, the, last are, the last three countries were El Salvador, Panama, and the Dominican Republic and before Costa Rica in 2007. And before so, it was Uruguay, Bolivia, Ecuador. Um, so why is that? Why is this occurring to Taiwan? Um, well, recently, and this is a, a screenshot from Nayib Bukele Twitter account, uh, El Salvador switched recognition and in exchange uh, as it says here in this Twitter, um, bilateral cooperation between China and El Salvador uh, involved the construction of a new stadium. Uh, and then other benefits that follow in this thread, in this Twitter thread. But the competition between Taiwan and China recently has been labeled checkbook diplomacy, given that uh, China has been trying to temptate um, Taiwan allies uh, using material benefits, such as this new stadium that uh, Bukele was promising to, to his electorate. Uh, still, there are four historical reasons why, why ta Taiwan is, is running out of allies 
that go much earlier than China's emergence as the second economy of the world. Um, the first of them was the exclusion of Taiwan from, from the United Nations in 1971 through Resolution 2758. Uh, and until then, Taiwan had occupied the seat of, of China in brackets or, or, or quote China, given that the one China policy uh, does not allow both the, the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China to be both uh, pretending to represent the same nation within an international organization. Uh, and you can see in the figure in the right that after 1971, a, a big chunk of countries switched relations from Taiwan to the People's Republic of China. But uh, that became a, a stronger trend after the US stopped recognizing China, uh, Taiwan and reapproached China in 1979. Um, and steadily, the trend has been uh, to countries slowly uh, recognize. China and de recognize Taiwan. So that will lead us to uh, our, the present day, 2001, in which uh, Taiwan is being recognized by a handful of countries, and China is putting pressure on those countries to convince them to stop uh, recognizing Taiwan and switch relations to China. So, again, the four main historical variables are those the, the exclusion. Uh, of Taiwan from the United Nations system, the loss of US recognition in 1979. The end of the Cold War was very important because, uh, and I, that, that's something I will speak in a second regarding to Paraguay, um, it, it diminished the importance of the anti-communist um, rhetoric that was using Taiwan to promote its foreign policy. And most recently, the rapid emergence of China has made very hard to Taiwan to keep, to keep its allies close to itself. Um, and speaking of Paraguay, uh, the hypothesis that we, that we worked with during our research was that beyond simple checkbook diplomacy, uh, Paraguay uses its diplomatic recognition policy for a particular form of, of, of small state status seeking, which means that Paraguay indeed benefits from, from its relationship with Taiwan. Although uh, at the same time, um, there's an opportunity cost, which means that China won't invest and won't provide loans, for, for example, to Paraguay, as it does to other countries in South America, such as Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Bolivia, and so on. Uh, to answer to this, to the, or to explore this hypothesis, um, we carried out uh, a lot of uh, interviews. Um, I can show you the table in one second. And it was particularly hard for us as foreigners to reach people who were willing to discuss this openly in, in Asuncion. We were lucky to have the collaboration of a few colleagues. One of them, uh, Gustavo Rojas, was very helpful in, in getting us to, to, to speak to people. But really, it was very hard to get to people to, to to get honest insight on, on why do why Paraguayans think that Taiwan and Paraguay should be diplomatic allies. Um, again, uh, this, this is an academic project, but I, we were always faced with the question of whether we were trying to elaborate a, a report either for the Foreign Affairs Ministry of China or Taiwan or there was always suspicions from, from people that we were uh, trying to push for something. There was an agenda behind this 
this research project, which for us was very intriguing. And then we realized that this was a very delicate domestic issue in, in Asuncion. Uh, and uh, indeed, when we had the chance to speak with people, uh, former foreign affairs ministers, uh, people working in the agro business, people working in the in in academia, um, senators, mm -hmm. deputies, politicians in general, um, we found that the what Taiwan means for Paraguay goes much deeper than a simple uh, diplomatic relationship. And uh, we reconstructed the, the, the meaning that Taiwan has for Paraguay and uh, basically divided the history in three periods. The first one goes from 1957 to the end or the pre-end of the of the Cold War. And uh, the origin of the relationship has to do with a particular bond between uh, Stroessner dictatorship and, and uh, Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, this is one of the, to me, one of the most interesting things of my visit to Asuncion, which is that uh, in 1986, Stroessner uh, baptized uh, Central Avenue in the city as Presidente Chiang Kai-shek that there's people from, from Asuncion hearing me, they might know this, this avenue quite well. Um, is this one actually, where you can also see a statue, a, a statue of, of Chiang Kai-shek. Um, so the first period, which is the one between 1957 and 1988, it's a period that I would label as the as two countries being joined by an anti-communism uh, agenda. And both Paraguay and Taiwan felt that they were fighting a similar struggle. And uh, that became the core of the symbolic structure that that, that created the strength of this relationship. And when the Cold War ended, uh, the relationship had to be reshaped and, and relabeled. And um, to Paraguay, the direct material benefits from, ta from Taiwan became very important. Um, for instance, in 2003, the, the Palacio Legislativo, la sede del Congreso was inaugurated and this is a screenshot from Aves de Color where it states that from a donation of 20 million dollars from Taiwan the building was was made was was constructed and uh, as a replacement of the the joint anti-communism between the two countries the transition to democracy in Paraguay and the end of of uh, the Cold War uh, meant that the two countries had to redefine uh, their bilateral relation. And um, Taiwanese aid to Paraguay is rather small, uh, at least at least compared to the size of the Paraguayan economy. Um, it consists basically of um, five-year donations, which uh, they were $71 million between 2008 and 2013. And again, $71, $71 million between 2013 and 2018. And in the last five years, they had doubled that amount. Um, I, I, I would guess that it has to do with the, with the higher pressure that Taiwan, Taiwan is, is feeling to maintain Paraguay as an ally. But, that's just that's just a guess, uh, and besides those five-year donations, um, Taiwan offers smaller donations, which which they try to uh, produce improvement in the in the development of the people who benefit from these donations. So there are donations to for housing projects to improve um, 
water to educate or provide uh, technical education to certain people, doctors, uh, uh, nurses, uh, engineers, and so on. Um, this table summarizes the laws that have been approved by the Paraguayan Congress in relation to these donations. Uh, if there are donations which come uh, beyond the discussion of, of Congress or uh, formal governmental documents, it's something that I can't, uh, we couldn't uh, systematize. Um, and these um, not huge aid from Taiwan to Paraguay is what became troublesome after 2003, I would say, after China's boom started to be felt in South America and the commodity boom especially uh, made uh, China a very important trade economic partner in the region. Uh, indeed, Paraguay uh, trades with China. Uh, still, uh, the relationship with Taiwan meant that it wouldn't benefit from investment, loans, credits that other countries benefited from. And uh, one thing that I wanted with Tom to, to understand during this project was what, which was the size of, of the, oppor the, the opportunity cost that we label the, the Taiwan cost. How much money a country as Paraguay is, uh, is missing uh, for not potentially missing for not recognizing China. Uh, it's, a, it's an exercise which, of course, uh, means that we need to be uh, making a lot of assumptions. First of all, that companies would be willing to invest in Paraguay and, and that Paraguay would be willing to get loans and credits from Chinese banks. But we gathered information from around 170 states and then uh, from Latin American countries, from a sample of around 30 countries, to estimate through econometrics um, and through similar cases as Paraguay, how much uh, were countries receiving in, in investments and loans when they had diplomatic relations with China and how much they were when they had relations with Taiwan. And uh, those countries which recognize China um, or that switch recognitions to, to China benefit in, in a sum which it's close to 1% of their GDP. So uh, between 2005 and 2014, which is the period uh, for which we had uh, good data, the annual average value of aid, investment, and financial flows from China uh, to Latin American countries with diplomatic relations with China represented 1% of their GDP. On the other hand, countries with re relationships with Taiwan uh, received virtually nil from China, almost nil. Um, so in these last years, given the, the stringent uh, checkbook diplomacy and uh, Taiwan knowing that it cannot compete uh, economically with, with China, the relationship be between Taiwan and Paraguay became one of pursuing meaningful projects that would, would have an impact in, in, in Paraguayan development. And one of them is the the Universidad Politécnica between Taiwan and Paraguay. And there are many other projects that uh, are similar to this one. I would say that the, the, the Universidad is the most meaningful and uh, the most iconic of this new period of relationships. And uh, still China has a lot of leverage over the Paraguayan economy, I would say. Um, first of all, through COFCO, uh, the China National Cereal Oil Foodstuff Corporation is one of the largest food corporations in the world. It's a state-owned enterprise under the management of, of, 
uh, a secretary in, 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 in China called SESAC, which administer large state-owned enterprises. And in 2014, it acquired 51% of, of Nidera, which is a very relevant uh, producer of soy and exporter of soy within Paraguay. Well, eventually in 2016, they bought the remaining 49%. So they own Nidera entirely. And, uh, and they are uh, now a player within the Paraguayan agribusiness. And Chem China, on the other hand, uh, bought Syngenta for $43 billion. It's one of the, the largest acquisitions ever from a Chinese state-owned enterprise. It might be the largest, I'm not sure. And Syngenta is a key player within Paraguay through the fertilizers and, and chemicals business that involves the agribusiness and the soil. Uh, and uh, Syngenta also bought Nidera Seeds, which is part of, of, of the company in charge of grains and seeds. And uh, this table shows, it's a small table, smaller than, than I thought, but um, it shows that Nidera, which is now Kofco, is within the top 10 exporters of soy. Um, the top 10 exporters uh, overall, including soy and meat within Paraguay. Um, above Natura, beyond Bunge. So it's, a, it's an important player in the agribusiness sector. Um, most recently, this is something that it's being discussed now in the, in the last weeks. Um, there's interest from a few state-owned earth enterprises, one of them, the Shanghai Greeting Company, in managing, bidding to access to manage the Argentinian section of the Parana Paraguay waterway, which is a key waterway through which Paraguay exports its, its commodities. And that would mean a larger leverage over the Paraguayan economy, right? This is hypothetical because the bid still to occur and there are companies from other countries, but if a Chinese state-owned enterprise won this bid, it would mean, to me, a stronger leverage over the Paraguayan economy. And then um, Paraguay's uh, recognition of Taiwan has effects on, on Mercosur. Mercosur is struggling, as you know, uh, and uh, one of the main reasons why it's struggling is due to its rigidities to allow countries to flexibly um, sign free trade agreements with other countries. So the, the, the Mercosur negotiates as a bloc, and it's only as a bloc that can sign free trade agreements. There's a push from Uruguay to flexibilize, flexibilize these uh, this rule called Rule 32. And uh, despite this rule is flexibilized or not, uh, potential free trade agreements between Mercosur and China won't occur as long as Paraguay recognizes Taiwan. So this is interesting as it might be the case that uh, the situation within this trade bloc could also have uh, an influence on, on within domestic politics in, in Paraguay. Uh, and more recently, uh, it's the case of the Chinese vaccine. Uh, I'm carrying out research, which is at the very early stages to understand political variables affecting uh, the allocations of Chinese vaccines, but we still don't know how, how much they, they these variables affected the, the, the access to vaccines. But uh, what we do know is that Chinese vaccines had a key role in the management of the pandemic in South America. I live in a country in Chile where uh, Sinovac vaccines were key to, to vaccinate around 70% of the population. I think we are now. Um, Around 90% of the vaccines that were applied in Chile uh, come from Sinovac. And indeed, Chile donated 
uh, 40,000 vaccines to Paraguay, uh, Sinovac vaccines to Paraguay through this system, this proto-cooperation, international cooperation structure called ProSur. And you can see in the table that uh, there are two countries which receive donations from, from China, from Chinese labs. One of them is Venezuela. They received 500,000 donations from Sinopharm, which is a state-owned uh, lab. And then um, the Dominican Republic, which is one of the countries which switched diplomatic recognition recently in the last three years, received uh, almost 800,000 800, uh, vaccines. Uh, more than 90% that of the vaccines, almost 100% of the vaccines that this country had acquired came from, from Coronavac, from Sinovac, and then also through the donation of 55,000 uh, jabs. So, um, Paraguay, I mean, uh, had, had had, I would like to hear this from you and discuss this and understand this better, has had uh, difficulties to, to access to vaccines in general. Um, and I don't know how much did uh, political variables play a role again, but what I know for sure, because I saw it in media, in Paraguayan media, is that the pandemic has made the, the relationship between Taiwan and Paraguay more visible to people. And at, at, at some point it has politicized it a bit. Uh, it has turned it into a political, domestic political issue. Um, so where are we, where are we now? Uh, my feeling from the research uh, that we have carried out with, with Tom is that the connection, the symbolic connection between Taiwan and Paraguay, mostly within the Colorado party, uh, is, it is strong enough to resist uh, the temptation from, from economic or material benefits from China, even in times of a, of a pandemic. Uh, but I'm not sure of what would happen uh, in a different government. Uh, the closest Paraguay has been from recognizing China was during Lugo's government. And um, I think it's very interesting from an academic standpoint to me to see what will happen uh, in, 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 in Paraguay in the next three, four years regarding this topic. I think it will become a very sensitive, it's already very sensitive, but it will become much more sensitive in, within Paraguay in the following years. I would like to know again, what do you think about this? Um, this is uh, anecdotal evidence that I can discuss later with you. And this is a list of the people that we interviewed that again, as I told you, was very hard to reach. Um, so this is what I had to present to you. Maybe we can, we can discuss or we can, we can, uh, do a Q&A and I would like to hear of, of you and, and see what you think about, about the, the Taiwan-Paraguay relationships as they are nowadays. Francisco, thank you very much. Uh, I don't want to jump in uh, prematurely, but um, you finished your presentation, is that right? Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. That's really very interesting stuff. And I just want to um, extend Francisco's invitation to anyone who would like to ask a question. You can, um, si quiere, lo puede hacer en español también y nosotros lo traducimos o... 
si quieres, um, or if you prefer, you can ask in English, either way. And also feel free to put your question, if you have one, in the chat. Um, you know, you can type it there if you would uh, like to do it that way. So um, in the meantime, um, also I, I, I appreciate the, uh, well, the, the puzzle that you pose there, Francisco, about Paraguay, uh, Taiwan relations. Uh, you, were, you said you were curious about kind of right now how um, the relationship is perceived within Paraguay. Um, and you, you invited anyone that might have insight into that to, to share their thoughts. Well, I, I don't want to put people on the spot, but I know one person from Paraguay in this virtual room with us. And I wondered if she might, you know, be able to even just, um, you know, reflect just in a very general kind of off the top of the head kind of way, Mercedes, um, you know, in terms of the way that Paraguay, you know, that, that China is portrayed or Taiwan is portrayed, maybe I could put the question to you, Mercedes, if that's okay. You know, in, in your experience, do you see much, for instance, in the newspapers or on the news, the daily news, uh, that mentions anything about Paraguay, Paraguay's relations with Taiwan or with China? Or perhaps these days, social media is more where these discussions happen. Have you picked up anything just in kind of popular um, discourse about these relationships, Mercedes? Um, actually, I would like to first give the chance to the audience because I see that we have two questions. In ah, the okay. Yes. Section. Um, we have one question from Jake, um, who is a, my classmate from uh, the subject Latin America in the world at the University of Melbourne. Um, and he says, you said that in Paraguay, support for Taiwan comes mostly from the elites. What is the view of Paraguay-Taiwan relations from normal Paraguayans, or is there little discourse around it? Thank you, Jake. Uh, I think there's little discourse around it. Uh, there have not been uh, nationally representative surveys, for instance. And I had been interested myself in, carry, in carrying out a survey around Paraguayans to know what they think about this. And it was very hard to do so. First, because uh, due to the lack of, of companies to, 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 to carry, out, carry out such a, a survey, but also because a few of them were not willing to do so. Uh, for some reason, uh, which I can guess, this is a very sensitive topic. Uh, and sometimes people are not willing to, to speak about it. Um, if you ask me from my little experience in Paraguay, uh, normal people are not very interested in this issue and actually do not know much about it. Uh, however, the the recent situation with the with the lack of vaccines uh, made this uh, this situation more visible. Uh, that's my my guess. I think that the pandemic has made uh, this foreign policy decision uh, much more visible to regular Paraguayans. I might I might be wrong because I don't have relatives or 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 or. I haven't been in Paraguay for a few, for a long time, but my feeling is that these issues are becoming more and more visible to public opinion. Uh, there's a second question in Spanish, uh, which is, ¿Cuáles crees que son los motivos por los cuales los políticos mantienen el reconocimiento a Taiwán. Voy a responder en español. Eh, las entrevistas que hicimos a políticos eh, muestran hay, que hay una, hay, es difícil generalizar porque hay una división ideológica muy grande. Eh, dentro del Partido Colorado hay una sensación de lealtad muy grande a Taiwán. 
Muchos mencionan cuánto Taiwán ayudó en momentos difíciles eh, y también mencionan la conexión del anticomunismo durante la Guerra Fría. Y son eh, variables simbólicas muy importantes, así como la enorme importancia que se le da a Taiwán en la agenda bilateral, a, a Paraguay en la agenda bilateral, que se puede ver muy bien en las visitas de Estado. Cuando Abdo va a, a, a Taipei es tratado muy bien, muy bien, eh, y recibido muy bien. Ese tipo de atención eh, argumentan los entrevistados Paraguay no lo recibiría de China. Paraguay sería un país más para, para China. En cambio, para, para, para Taiwán es un país muy importante. Y ese tipo de atención simbólica eh, es lo que creo que funciona mucho como un, como un justificativo. Eh, y ese creo que es uno de los motivos más grandes. Y creo que otro de los motivos es que cuando la discusión se planteó en términos materiales durante el gobierno de Lugo, eh, rápidamente se ideologizó. Es decir, eh, es una discusión ideológica en parte, pero también, y muestra la investigación, es una discusión material. Es decir, hay un costo de oportunidad económico. Ese costo de oportunidad económico nunca se discutió domésticamente en el Paraguay. Lo que se discutió fue la variable ideológica, eh, que es la que primó. ¿no? Eh, queremos estar con la China comunista o con, la, o con Taipei y qué posición tenemos en ese sentido, en esa cuestión valórica. Y esa fue un poco la variable clivaje doméstico. Eh, Así que es ahí donde yo creo que ha pasado un poco la discusión y también en la ausencia de un lobby eh, que en otros países sí existe, tal vez muy fuerte, del agro y del sector agroexportador por mejorar el vínculo con, con China. Y aquí estoy pensando en Brasil, donde hay un lobby fuertísimo eh, por tener una relación sólida y lo más fructífera posible con, con, con China. Francisco, en, en, en tu investigación eh, vos te referís al costo-oportunidad. ¿Te gustaría extender un poco más en relación a ese punto? Porque haces una comparación en relación a otros países de la región. Sí, ese... ¿En inglés o en español? Y se la pregunta en español porque tenía relación con el, con el punto anterior nomás, pero... Sí, el costo de oportunidad eh, es interesante de medirlo como un contrafáctico. Es decir, no sabemos qué pasaría o qué hubiese pasado si Taiwán, eh, si Paraguay hubiese tenido relaciones con Taiwán y no, con China y no con Taiwán, perdón, en los últimos 10, 15 años. Pero a través de modelos econométricos uno puede generar eh, estimaciones de cuántos países eh, similares o en situaciones similares y bajo similares circunstancias recibieron en inversiones, en préstamos y demás. Eso es complejo, fue otra parte compleja de la investigación porque hubo que recopilar información de inversión extranjera directa a China en, en, en en más de 100 países, unos 170 países, lo mismo que créditos, y hubo que sistematizar esa información al mismo tiempo que controlar por variables, obviamente, que pueden determinar estos préstamos e inversiones para tratar de llegar a una cifra lo más eh, acertada posible, es decir, que fuera conservadora, pero que al mismo tiempo nos permitiese entender este costo de oportunidad. Eh, y bueno, el costo de oportunidad eh, es, al menos desde el punto de vista de la inversión china, es evidente, pues en Paraguay la inversión china es eh, virtualmente cero, con la excepción del, del, del caso de Ken China eh, adquiriendo Singenta y, y Kofco adquiriendo Nidera, pero eran activos que ya estaban establecidos en el Paraguay, ¿cierto? Entonces, eh, 
la, la ausencia de inversión ciertamente se debe a una variable política y de eso no, no hay duda. Eh, en ese sentido hay un costo de oportunidad. Eh, y después respecto al... al eh, al acceso a crédito, financiamiento para infraestructura y demás del Banco de, del banco de Desarrollo Chino, del Exim Bank, son bancos políticos en China. Eso generalmente va mucho con, con, con los proyectos que tengan los gobiernos para desarrollar infraestructura, sea portuaria, hidrovías y demás. O sea, es hipotético, no podemos saber qué proyectos se pudiesen haber financiado. Pero lo interesante, o el punto que hace el trabajo es que China hace uso de sus herramientas económicas para tentar y doblar eh, o digamos, eh, reducir el peso de estas variables más históricas, eh, ideológicas entre los países para que la tentación, digamos, el, el costo de oportunidad de no reconocer a China sea tan alto que no le dé la oportunidad a los países de realmente plantearse si, si debieran o no continuar reconociéndolo. Francisco, I, I um, want to, uh, thanks for your, that's great answer. I want to ask you um, this uh, other question here. I'll just uh, kind of um, draw it to your attention. There's a, a question from Vanessa um, that's, that she's written there. And it, I, I, li I really like this question because it, it sort of encourages us to think in the long durée, the, the long kind of unfolding of history and where yes. things are going globally. So, uh, I, you know, this is a good question and I, I would understand if you don't have, you know, a solid answer for it, but I'd be interested and I think Vanessa would too in just your reflections. And so she asks, do you think that this current diplomatic agenda will change in perhaps 20 or 30 years time? What do you think? Uh, I think it, it would, I mean, this is a great question because this is such a sensitive topic for the People's Republic of China. In 20 years, I would say they expect uh, Taiwan to be part of its territory. Um, and by the time the People's Republic of China turns 100 years in 2049, that would be very much desirable to the Chinese government. If that means first uh, dragging out Taiwan from diplomatic allies. I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if pressure to these 14, 15 countries that still recognize China will be too strong to resist uh, in the next five years or even before. Uh, why, and this is something we didn't discuss, I didn't want to make it too boring, but the recognition of, of nation states also depend, uh, the sovereignty of nation states, oh, sorry, depends very much on recognition. It's very hard to remain as a country without being recognized by a single other country. There are a few instances of what they are called peria states. They tend to last very little after they run out of diplomatic allies. Um, because there's, there's a relational component in our international society, which has to do with how sovereignty is, is, uh, is assumed as, as a control of a certain territory. If, if, if Taiwan runs, runs out of, of uh, those 14 allies in the next 10 years or so, uh, it will be almost impossible to think that the People's Republic of China won't annex it to its territory, which is again, I would say very important for the People's Republic of China looking towards the 100th anniversary of the country. Uh, today, a colleague shared with me an interesting news that you can Google of, of Taipei opening an office in, in Latvia and producing a diplomatic crash between China and the EU uh, due to the assumed, China assumed that Taiwan was tempting Latvia to change a diplomatic status. I mean, to play with, with, the, with the law of the checkbook diplomacy. 
that caused a very strong re reaction from China. And you can Google. So at least China is very much decided not to lose a single ally to Taiwan. And if they can win one of those 14, they will happily do so. Um, so I think this is a, 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 an agenda that will be it will be, it will be, this will become a very hot issue in the, in, in the next five to 10 years, much earlier than 20 to 30 years time. Okay, well, there, there we go. The, uh, we can look for that, Vanessa, and perhaps, uh, in other words, still within our lifetimes easily, but actually much before we're old and wrinkled and 30 years from now, we might see some real movement on this. And, you know, I think that's <clears throat> very possible as well, as Francisco indicates, for other countries as well. But um, let's not get too much into our predictions. Let's, uh, let's take uh, this question from Linda. Thanks, Linda, for, for this. <clears throat> I'll read it out. Do you think the enormous appeal of the Chinese market for Paraguay's beef and soy industries may yet lead to a switch for Paraguay's foreign policy, or the relation with Taiwan produce mutual but asymmetrical benefits that are more of the same importance for Paraguay's development that will stay recognizing Taiwan? Or, you know, would those things um, lead Paraguay to keep on the current path yes. with Taiwan? Uh, that's a great question, Linda. Thank you, because uh, one of the first thing that, the things that we found out during the early stages of the research was that Paraguay indeed imports a lot of goods from China and also exports to China through third countries, what they call triangular. So basically they send beef to close countries from China, and then this is re-exported to, to Chinese market. At a higher cost, yes, but they managed to reach the market. Uh, the market would be larger for meat and soy exporters if they recognize China. Yes, it would, but to me, the pressure from the agro sector during the time we carried out the, the research was surprisingly low. Uh, they were, again, as I said, much quieter that, than they are in Argentina or in Brazil, for example. Um, but uh, who knows? I mean, uh, one of the reasons why this is the case is that much or a good part of the, of the large ag agro producers in Paraguay are very close to the Colorado Party. Um, ideologically and, and uh, this creates certain complexities uh, between ideological uh, preferences and then material preferences or economic preferences. But I would say that the, the exporters and the importers are quite happy with the status quo as it is now. Um, to me, the pressure the so-called Taiwan cost comes more from the financial side, which is foreign direct investment loans. And we could add nowadays the health dimension to it, which is the vaccines. Not so much the trade. Indeed, trade was not included as a variable in, in the model. Uh, again, because Paraguay found a way to still trade with with China, uh, despite its diplomatic status. Uh, thank you, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> I'm just seeing. I thought I saw there's a new question there, but perhaps not. Um, well, I, I have a question, but before I ask you, um, Francisco. I, could I perhaps return for a moment um, to the question that sort of related to uh, the very first question 
uh, that we had in the, the Q&A, uh, which was about just sort of public um, impressions in Paraguay of the uh, relationship with Taiwan and with China. And, uh, you know, you, you already answered this to some extent, but I just wondered about how much, but, uh, you know, the, the issue of China-Taiwan emerges in, say, social media or in the press or on TV um, in Paraguay. Mercedes, I think uh, you were going to give us maybe some insight into that. Um, would you be able to share some thoughts on that? Um, I have a question first. I don't know if you can reply this or Francisco, but I know that there are some countries that they still manage to benefit from both Taiwan and China trade relations. So how, how can that be possible? Is that because of power and like, um, I don't know, like um, size or what, what's the point behind those countries? Yeah, well, uh, as, you, as you may know, uh, in Chile, for instance, where I, I live, uh, has, uh, Taiwan has a trade office, as it does in Argentina, as it does in Brazil. So tra again, trade is not, it's not very much an issue. The issue is that this is a very hot geopolitical topic, uh, which uh, produces uh, a lot of pressure from, from countries uh, who want to have a good relationship with the second largest economy in the world. Uh, and I don't know how to manage to have a good relationship with, I mean, we, I don't want to give a policy advice in this regard, and I don't have a, a position in this regard. I mean, um, I know that countries which recognize China manage to, to have dialogue and trade relations with Taiwan. It's, it's harder the other way around, but, um, it's true that, that countries figure out ways to do so. Uh, but how to proceed or how would a country do so? It's very hard to tell. I mean, um, and I, I wouldn't feel uh, uh, in the position to do so. That, that would be a policy recommendation, which uh, definitely I don't want to, to do, given how, how sensitive this, this issue is. Uh, but uh, bringing the domestic dimension in Paraguay, and again, I, 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 I would like to listen from you, as, as Adrian said, what do Paraguayans think about it? I think that's key to know when or could, or maybe, I mean, whether it could or not, and when it could or not happen in Paraguay, the first thing to know is what the public opinion thinks about it. Uh, maybe there's not a position, maybe this is simply a, a non-issue. Um, that's something I don't know. I'm very curious. I'm, I'm, there, there might be some IR students here, I don't know, who could uh, turn this into a research, research project because there's a lot, I mean, something that I'm sure is that this article brought more questions than answers to me. There's a lot to understand still from, from the Paraguayan situation that, and I cannot know, I cannot do it because I'm, I'm from, I'm a foreigner. I live outside Asuncion. I live outside Paraguay. Someone within Paraguay could write a wonderful book on this issue. Uh, if he or she is willing to maybe deal with such a sensitive topic, I mean, it might be, it might be a challenge, but, uh, but it's certainly interesting. Yes, um, it is indeed interesting. And as you said, even though you are not Paraguayan, I appreciate your interest in such a sensitive topic and highly political. Um, from my personal view, um, as you were asking before, um, I've been listening to this topic um, for
for a while. Um, but I think that most of, of the of the debate um, is associated with the beef market and the um, soy industry. Um, because as you know, uh, an important uh, part of our economy comes from livestock and agriculture. Um, but I think that this is a good start. We still have to strengthen the dialogue around this issue because um, it tends to be considered as a, like, a taboo topic. Um, but I think that this is a good start and, and also because it's uh, within the academia and we are discussing this um, based on our research. So I really appreciate both you and, and Tom um, for considering this uh, sensitive uh, foreign <clears throat> issue that is, uh, I think, super relevant for Paraguay and even the region. Yeah, thank you. Again, as I said, when we try to interview people in Asuncion, the first thing they asked was whether we were, what was our position? Are you in favor of uh, switching recognition? Are you in favor of, of keeping the status quo? Well, we have no position in this regard. We are trying to understand. We are trying to shed light on, on, on the variables that have a, a, an influence in this decision. And that, that was a challenge for us. And I'm, I think it's a fascinating international relations topic, uh, especially for a country like Paraguay, because it shows that even when you are a small country, again, quote, small in terms of the relevance that a country can have in the international system, uh, you can still be uh, in a key spot. So Paraguay nowadays, it's such in a such in a hot spot, uh, geopolitically speaking. It's the largest country that, that still recognizes Taiwan, largest in GDP and in geographical dimensions. In GDP, I'm not sure. I need to. It's Guatemala or or Paraguay, but still, it's a very important partner to Taiwan, and that creates pressure. I'm sure that it creates pressure domestically within the Foreign Affairs Ministry. To me, that's fascinating as a scholar, but that's maybe the lack of being a scholar, which is I'm, I'm isolated from those daily stresses and pressures and, 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 um, and the pressure of, of taking decisions and so on. But uh, it's a fascinating topic that mixes history and diplomacy and also economics. And um, again, I hope it, it, it creates interest within the young generation of IR scholars in Paraguay, which I know it's growing and it's growing fast. And um, that would be fascinating. You know, it's something that wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. And it might be the case that in a few years, Paraguayan scholars start to publish on this issue. Yeah, I, I'd just add, if I may, on, on this point, you know, that there are several countries that have tried to kind of balance uh, China and Taiwan to get, well, in the end, uh, a calculation of the greatest benefit, often in the form of some, some sort of foreign aid. Um, and we've seen that play out over the past 10 years. Um, you know, there was a period where the leaders of both China and Taiwan realized that this was counterproductive and it was quite divisive. So they agreed to, to not um, try to convince countries, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean. As I mentioned, that's where the stronghold of Taiwan has been historically. But there was an agreement um, about 10 years ago that this should stop, that this sort of trying to poach each other's countries. So a period of detente, but really about four years ago, that, that shows signs of coming to an end and that now the competition seems to be back on again, 
right? And so since 2017, uh, three countries have shifted from Taiwan to China, Dominican Republic, Panama, and El Salvador. Um, mm. And I think perhaps one other, but I know that those three for sure. Um, and so this, this indicates, you know, that the competition is alive and well. And if you, if you ask the question, well, why are those countries shifting from Taiwan to China? I, you know, you just look at what it means for each of them in an instrumental way, in a sort of cold economic way. What does this mean? And you mentioned, Francisco, the importance of trade and investment. Um, but often what it comes down to is just, you know, these aid packages and building things like uh, public service offices for the government, sometimes sports stadiums and things like this. Um, I wanted to respond as well just to this, this question, Mercedes, that you posed uh, about, um, you know, trying to benefit from, from both China and Taiwan in the Australian case. Well, in the Australian case, you know, there's an understanding, first of all, that the relationship with Taiwan is real, it exists, but it's unofficial. It's not an official diplomatic relationship, obviously, because Australia recognizes uh, China and recognizes China's position on the one China policy, doesn't officially endorse it, but recognizes it. Um, and that's a, a kind of piece of diplomatic maneuvering that goes back to the 1970s. Um, but there is a bilateral economic what they call a bilateral economic consultation between Australia and Taiwan. Uh, and that has really presided over, um, you know, the, the trade and investment relationships to try to see where there is mutual benefit. So the last figure I saw was about um, three, maybe four years ago when I was looking at this, that there's um, uh, about 13 to $14 billion dollars of bilateral trade between Australia and Taiwan. Um, but as I say, this, this is limited very clearly to uh, the economic sphere and doesn't get into politics. So much so that uh, I, I perceive a real sensitivity um, on the Taiwanese side that they don't want to embarrass Australia by, by speaking kind of in, a, an, in an open and, um, you know, too much of a, a kind of public way about this relationship, because it's quite clear that Australia already has a, let's say, turbulent relationship with China. And, uh, you know, if Taiwan were to go around advertising and celebrating this, the kind of vibrant trade and investment relationship with Australia, that wouldn't do Australia any favors. Because, uh, as I say, there's already enough complication in Australia's relationship with, with, uh, with China. So I think there's a, a, an understanding, a sort of informal understanding between Australia and um, Taiwan, that they can do trade and investment, but they keep the relationship kind of um, not under the radar, but they don't go around celebrating it openly too much. Um, I would just mention as well that for those who are interested in, in following up on these issues, particularly in the, in the, the Taiwan Latin America case, uh, that as well as looking at Francisco's publications, including the one we've been discussing with Tom Long, uh, which is really insightful, but Francisco has been working on the, this issue as well, and you can find his work online. You could also have a look at the work recently of the Inter-American Dialogue. Um, which has done some great work around this issue. Margaret Myers runs the, the China Latin America program there at the Dialogue. Um, and I, I believe, um, you know, probably Francisco, you would have interacted with them at some point. I certainly have, uh, because they Absolutely. run a program that looks specifically at China Latin America relations. And Taiwan figures into that, of course. So you can have a look at the Inter-American Dialogue website where there's a lot of information and resources that's publicly available um, for those who would like to follow up. Now I see uh, Mercedes, you've put your hand up. I, uh, feel free. Um, I would just uh, like to invite Franz. Um, I promote him as, as a panelist so that he can talk because um, I know 
um, he knows a lot about this topic and he also studied at the University of Melbourne. Um, I don't know, Fran, if you would like to share some thoughts on this. It seems that Franz, Franz might have run for a morning coffee. <laughs> okay. We, we should but just. Yeah, the, the research carried out by the Inter American Dialogue is very good. Um, I'm thinking here. Well, I, we have compiled a data set on the so called mask diplomacy in Latin America, which compares Chinese and Taiwanese donations. We made uh, that data set last year, it took us uh, a lot of effort. It was a, a lot of work. Um, let me share the, with, with, with you the, the link. Um, it's it's, in, it's uh, uploaded in the Centro de Estudios Asiáticos. Uh, and you can compare where and whom from China and from Taiwan donated uh, to to us, uh, to us Latin Americans. I guess. Um, there you go. Um, Thanks, Francisco. That link is in the chat, everybody. If you'd like to um, access that resource. Yeah, uh, but then uh, again, I think. From an academic standpoint, uh, this is a very interesting uh, research topic um, that it's very useful. I mean, sometimes uh, for me, this grew as a, as a personal question that I, I couldn't answer. But then eventually I realized that, uh, again, from Paraguay and through Paraguay, there's uh, a lot of things that can be understood of how um, geopolitics and the current world works nowadays. And that's fascinating to me from a region that sometimes feels so far away. Uh, we, can, we can find cases in which uh, there's a lot to be learned, even for people who don't study Latin America. Um, and there are other areas which also need to be studied as well. The role of diaspora. Adrian has done a lot of research on, on the role of diasporas. Diasporas or diasporas? How it's said? How we, how that's said in English? Yeah, diasporas. Uh, yeah. There's there's a, a Taiwanese diaspora in, in Paraguay as well that could be studied and understood. Uh, I haven't done because I don't have the means to do so. That's something very interesting. Uh, the role of Taiwanese importers into, into Paraguay and so on. It's very interesting, it's such a very interesting topic. So again, I hope that at least this research serves as a, as a first little step to motivate and encourage Paraguayan young scholars to, to explain us more about this issue. I mean, uh, Again, the paper, I think, poses more questions than answers. And I, we, we try to provide a couple of answers, but I think there's a lot still to be understood. And through the study of, for example, diplomatic documents, archives, interviews with key players, interviews with diasporas, uh, this story could be much better understood. Um, so uh, hopefully this will be the first of several articles. Um, there might be one of you in this, in this room who are studying IR. I don't know if you Mercedes are, but uh, if you are, uh, go ahead because we are willing to, you know, uh, learn and understand much more from this, this case. Thank you, Francisco, and thank you, Adrian. Um, before closing this conference, on behalf of the PSA, I would like to thank our sponsors, 
the University of Melbourne and the Graduate Student Association at the University of Melbourne. The success of this event would not have been possible without the support and nurturing of the PSA Commission 2021. Our warmest gratitude to each of the speakers and hosts who join us on our journey to promote constructive dialogues between students, academics, and professionals from various universities, Paraguayan government authorities, and the private sector, all with the common aim to demonstrate the positives, current, and emerging opportunities that are for the Paraguayan nation. It has been a wonderful warming experience to gather 13 academics from six different universities, such as National University of Asuncion, Catholic University of Asuncion, the University of Melbourne, La Trobe University, Duke University, Pontifical Catholic University of Chile from uh, Francisco is joining from this university, all across four countries. We wish to continue strengthening academic ties between Paraguay, Australia, and the rest of the world. I hope to keep this incredible network connected throughout this challenging pandemic times and continue engaging in meaningful projects in the future. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Thank Mercedes, you. gracias. Thank you, Francisco, and everyone for joining us. Thank you. And hopefully Great we'll cross paths again all and, in person. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.